This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. And by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Quijou. And my name is Sunny Agarwal. Today on the show, we interview Dan Robinson, who is currently a research partner at Paradigm and but you know he's had a quite an interesting journey throughout the entire blockchain space. He spent time at Chain uh, and was there when it kind of got like uh, acquired by Stellar, and so worked on that. And he, then he left to work on uh, Joint Paradigm, at, at, which is a hedge fund. Dan has a lot of really interesting experiences throughout the blockchain space, and you know he'll mention it himself. But you know I think what he's really good at is taking ideas from one section in the blockchain space and like applying it to another so you know for example like he was the one who came up with the idea of plasma cash and i think you know he was able to do that because of his like intimate knowledge of you know the bitcoin system where where, uh, a lot some of the interesting things about how bitcoin does its utxos and was able to apply that to the development work going on at plasma and so the main project that we actually talk about uh, t- uh, today is his Rainbow Networks proposal. And I think that is like a, a, a complete gr- great example of this, where he takes a lot of ideas from, you know, Plasma and Interledger and Lightning and kind of like combines them together into this very interesting proposal. Yeah, and it, it is a, a bit of an early project at the moment. It's it's a white paper and maybe like I think there's a blog post about it or something or it's mentioned in a blog post. But yeah, reading the white paper, probably a good compliment to the show because it is kind of technical, I guess, and requires a lot of sort of like mental mathematics to understand like the payment channels and how they work. But in the white paper, there are some tables there that would at least uh, help you to get a better understanding about like how these payments and how these these assets are moving from one party to another in the channels. But yeah, yeah, interesting character and kind of the link with the previous episode of last week is that Dan actually is the person who uh, got Jill Carlson to work at Chain, um, which she mentioned in the episode. Yeah. And like you mentioned, it is a bit of an early project where he mentions in the episode that, you know, he actually has no plans of implementing it himself. But and so, you know, normally we at, at, at Epicenter, we've been trying to bring on projects who are maybe a little bit farther along on their development cycles. But, you know, I think it's actually very interesting to also bring occasionally some of these earlier projects, because something interesting about this Rainbow Networks thing is that it was actually a little bit of a rediscovery where this was actually what the Lightning team was originally working on. So Taj uh, Dryja, he actually worked on a project called Mirrors uh, before uh, coming up with Lightning. And that was, I, you know, from... From the brief, you know, like the Mirror's website is all gone and everything now. But, you know, by, I was digging around archive.org, the Internet Archives, and, you know, I'm like, oh, wow, this is actually very similar to the Mirror stuff. And so it'd be like, you know, a shame if some of these ideas like disappeared into the night again. And so, you know, if, if anyone in this, uh, after listening to this episode and reading the paper is like inspired to, you know, take their shot at like... Uh, trying to implement some of this stuff. I'm sure like, you know, Dan would love to like chat with you guys about this and like help you out as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So why don't you tell us about this Cosmos event coming up in a few weeks? Yeah, sure. So they're in Berlin at the full node office in Berlin. Uh, Cosmos will be having uh, two days of an uh, interchain unconference where we talk about different things going on in the Cosmos community, as well as just in the Cosmos development and interchain work. And then uh, we have a two-day hackathon uh, where people can come and hack on, you know, anything they want relating to interchain, interoperability. And so a lot of the Epicenter guests, uh, hosts are going to be there at uh, both of these events and, you know, even moderating some panels and stuff. And 
So yeah, uh, if you if you guys are interested in uh, are in the area in Berlin and want to come hack on some stuff, uh, please definitely come check out the hackathon. I think this might be even the first time all five of us are in the same place. So we're still waiting on some confirmations, but we might all be there, which would be a, a historic <laughs> event. Uh, so when is this taking place and how can people learn more? The event is going on. Uh, the unconference is going on from the 13th to the 14th of June. And then the uh, Cosmos Hack Atom uh, is from June 15th to June 16th. And you can uh, l- learn more by going to hackatom-berlin.cosmos.network. Okay, and we'll add links to that in the show notes. Uh, just one more thing I wanted to mention before we do this interview is that I am so happy to be back with my studio gear uh, that has been locked up in a storage bin for the last or storage locker for the last year and some months. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, effectively uh, hanging up my my nomad shoes and have settled back into sort of the Paris area. And I'll be here for the foreseeable future. So traveling through Europe, going to some events here and there. Also, you know, obviously like hanging out in Berlin a little bit. But uh, yeah, it's really great to have my my mic again and my my sound card and like my proper lighting and setup and everything. So really excited to be back. And um, yeah, getting back to working on the podcast and like uh, getting back and sort of like into the Europe blockchain scene uh, more uh, in a more concrete manner. So we forgot to mention how you can actually register for the event that's taking place in Berlin before the Cosmos Hackathon that Sunny just mentioned. So effectively, there is an event happening in Berlin on June 13th and 14th. It is called Interchain Conversations, and it is a two-day event with keynotes, workshops, panel discussions, and sessions on uh, protocol design, Cosmos, uh, blockchain interoperability, and blockchain intercommunication, and all that fun stuff. If you want to register, please go to epicenter.rocks slash interchain berlin that'll take you right to the eventbrite page where you can register the cost of registration is 165 dollars but for the first 10 epicenter listeners who register and use the code epicenter you'll get 65 dollars off so tickets will be 100 dollars. places are limited so if you're planning on going i would suggest that you register uh sooner than later links will be in the show notes so come hang out with us at full node in berlin it would be great to see you and with that here is the interview so we're here today with Dan Robinson, who is a research partner at Paradigm and the author of the Rainbow Network paper. Uh, nice to have you on the show, Dan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So, you know, I think I met you for the first time, I think, two or three years ago at one of the IC3 uh, events. And back then you were working at Chain. Uh, but then since then, you found yourself working on many different projects throughout the entire space. And so we hope to touch on uh, a a bunch of them uh, in today's episode. But, you know, to start off with, you know, your your, your Twitter bio famously says lawyer comma coder. And so, you know, could you tell us a little bit about that and like how you, uh, you know, how you got into the crypto space and into, you know, coding in general coming in from a very different field? Yeah, sure. So I I think it says coder, Coder, comma lawyer, comma coder slash lawyer in that order. Um, and primarily, I don't I don't consider myself a lawyer anymore. I'm retired from the bar, uh, but I did go to law school and I spent a couple of years as a securities lawyer in New York before I got into um, uh, working as an engineer full time, um, and then now as an investor. And you know, I think uh, it's sort of a common story um, where I ended up I went to law school without really realizing, really thinking hard about what I wanted to do. Um, and while I was in law school, realized with kind of a sense of growing dread that I preferred programming to um, to working as a lawyer. And that's around the, that's the same time I got into in uh, Bitcoin and was uh, following Bitcoin. And then when it came out, Ethereum. Uh, yeah, you know, I just, I just sort of knew as soon, uh, even before I started at the law firm that I think it was probably a, a relatively limited time, but I wanted to try it out. How did you start to you know get involved with coding? Like you know, just completely self taught. Yeah, so when I was um, in like middle school, I started um, uh, just sort of programming uh, as a hobby, and didn't do it too much. Like, did it worked on sort of projects um, through college. While I was in law school, I took a co- I cross registered into a couple courses because then I I kind of realized I really liked engineering, so I cross registered into a couple of CS classes. Um, but 
I, what I wish I'd done, and there's sort of the, my, my regret from college isn't, I don't really regret necessarily, um, my, I mean, you know, I, I didn't major in CS, which I think I caught up for the, um, for, on sort of for the most part. But what I regret most is, uh, there's a lot of kind of academic CS theory that I really do enjoy, um, learning about and studying. It's kind of, uh, I've been lucky to, to have jobs where I can kind of, uh, learn and catch up on that. But if I could go back, I think some of the sort of the really, uh, like the fundamentals of computer science, for example, and programming language theory, um, those are areas that I ended up really liking and, and funny enough, end up kind of being relevant in uh, parts of the job. That's really interesting because as someone who is, I mean, I didn't study computer science, but I'm quite technical because I've been coding also since I was in middle school. I often regret now that I'm in the blockchain space and there are all these like sort of legal issues coming up that I would have studied law because I just find it so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Although it means that everybody comes and asks you these questions. Um, and first of all, even, even, you know, real lawyers don't even know the answer to yet about what secur- securities laws apply to, what money transmitter laws apply to. Um, and lawyers aren't really necessarily any better at, um, at thinking about those and thinking through those issues than uh, relatively talented engineers are. They just a have more context and b know when not to give an answer. So you're you're less likely to get sort of a stupid <laughs> answer from a lawyer, um, probably. But ultimately, you know, I think it's the idea that tr- treating it as this kind of like arcane thing. At least that's how we think of like medicine. Like I have no idea how to. How, I don't think anyone uh, who hasn't been to medical school could. Uh, I wouldn't trust them to sort of open up my heart. But um, for law, like you can actually, you know, when it's just like literally arguing on Twitter, I actually think lawyers kind of overrate the extent to which there's this kind of cast uh, that you need to join in order to be able to talk about it with any kind of qualification. So last week on the uh, podcast, we had uh, Jill Carlson. And so she also got her start at Chain. And she uh, actually said that you're the one who introduced her to Chain. And that's how she got started there. So I guess how did, um, in that case, how did you get started with Chain? Yeah, so um, I left law very intentionally um, with no, uh, just sort of took a leap off a cliff um, without sort of a, a, a job in hand or in mind, uh, in part because I wanted to interview for places and have them not think that I wasn't serious about um, about leaving my law firm job. So I did do a boot camp called Recurse Center, which is a, it was a really great program. It's a three-month um, self-directed uh, coding um, sort of like retreat in New York City. And you can work on sort of whatever you want. Is actually taking that right now. Oh, cool! Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I'd recommend it to anybody um, who knows who you know already knows how to program, but wants to sort of get better at stuff. And when I joined that, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a web developer or a data engineer or something. And I was thinking like, just let me do the most sort of like boring, normal, employable uh, engineering skills. But funny enough, they kind of um, there I got introduced to all this stuff around programming language theory and functional programming. Um, that led into uh, a lot of what I was sort of obsessed with while I was at Chain on on Ivy and, and programming language theory, and all these other sort of projects. And I think uh, I like learned Rust there, uh, and it sort of sent me down these weird rabbit holes that, um, as well as, as as cryptocurrency stuff, uh, that end up being funny enough, sort of much more employable than just being a normal engineer, at least in my experience. So now you're at Paradigm. Can you give us a high level overview of Paradigm and what your role is there? Yeah, so um, I'm uh, in research at Paradigm, which has sort of two meanings. One is kind of the investment um, meaning of research, like diligence and investment, sourcing investments, um, uh, following tr- general trends in the space. And the other is kind of contributing to uh, like protocol research. So still working on um, some open source projects, working on um, uh, sort of like elaborating on some ideas like uh, this paper, which I came out with um, a couple months ago called the Rainbow Network. So that was something that, you know, uh, I think it's, 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 this was sort of great that the, the paradigm supported me in working on this kind of thing and um, uh, lets me sort of continue this kind of open source research that I've been doing. What What is the reason why like a fund would be funding like this pretty practical research into these networks? Is Is there like a thesis here? This particular project just came out of my own interest um, and the fund's interest in decentralized finance um, and uh, protocols around that. And then also my interest in um, off-chain scaling. And uh, to some extent, I think it's, it's hard to really get a deep understanding for something unless you try to really like uh, either implement it or innovate on it. 
Um, and so it was, it was sort of my uh, attempt to like actually really solidify some stuff that I was maybe like guessing about. I was thinking, oh, maybe this could work. And I thought, I really have to actually try to design this as a system before I can really get a good understanding of it. So it's part of the firm generally having a prepared mind uh, around uh, newer research. Yeah. And so, you know, based on your interest in uh, off-chain scaling, you know, I was like kind of telling Sebastian earlier, you're, you're, you're like the layer two god. Like, you know, you've worked on like basically every single layer two solution that like or, or a lot of the layer two solutions that, 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 you know, people are working on today. So, you know, just for some context, like, af- so you actually, af- before you joined Paradigm, you were there during that process when Chain was sort of merged with uh, the, the light year it, to create the uh, interstellar uh, company. And so and so there you actually started working on a project called Starlight. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what that project was and what the goal there with, with that was? Sure. So Starlight was an adaptation of um, lightning-like payment channels on the Stellar network. And so that was something... Um, yeah, that had been sort of a, a, it was originally, the design was originally developed by um, Jed McCaleb and Jeremy Rubin um, and a couple others from Stellar. And so I was sort of product managing, working on uh, turning that into a, into a full spec and um, and Im- implementing and, and releasing the demo for it. So that's just, it's just payment channels, um, but done on, uh, on the Stellar uh, protocol. I sort of built on top of um, what was currently there. And that, 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 kind of work, um, trying to figure out how to apply uh, to sort of like hack together a smart contract system on top of a system that isn't really designed um, to support it. Um, that was something that I think I'd, I'd learned a lot about working on Ivy while I was at Chain um, and writing Ivy compilers to like every which platform. And so yes, yeah, so that served me well, I think. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos, the internet of blockchains. Cosmos is live and we couldn't be more excited to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow, and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core, an advanced implementation of the BFT proof of stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. So moving on to then some other work that you've done, uh, tell us about the work you did in Plasma Cash and Plasma Debit. Plasma, so I, I was first sort of like learned about Plasma. Um, well, they released, they released this white paper on it, but uh, I sort of dug deep into it around um, this was January of, uh, of 2018. And I was looking specifically uh, at at Plasma MVP, which was this kind of plasma that um, it had, it, it was it was um, a relatively uh, interesting and secure way to do side chains, but had these sort of major flaws. One of which was that if you, if someone, uh, the, the the operator of a particular plasma chain can sort of denial of service attack the network by just by uh, not revealing any blocks and. So there's there's this attack called a mass exit problem where basically um, everybody has to immediately take an action on the main chain um, to get out of that. And the other the other problem with it is that you have to validate basically the entire block um, on the side chain, so you don't really get it as a scaling solution. And so uh, Plasma Cash comes out of thinking about um, well, how do we pare down the feature set that this side chain allows um, in order to make it uh, make the burden on the user much uh, much lower, and make the uh, make make it generally more secure. Um, and it actually takes a lot of ideas, I think, from payment channels. And something that I worked on a little later, um, Plasma Debit, uh, carries that even further in terms of like really drawing an analogy between these payment channels and payment channel networks like Lightning or Interledger, um, and applying it to uh, Plasma uh, to Plasma Cash, building it, putting it on top of Plasma Cash. 
So what what is your like current involvement on the Plasma project? Like, do you, are you like actively involved with development or was it sort of you just like kind of proposed it and then kind of let other people carry it, like, you know, take it over after that? Yeah, so my, my modus operandi usually is is not to stick around too long for all the really hard actual work. And that's what Plasma Group, <laughs> um, uh, Plasma Group is a fantastic team. And they, they've been sort of like really uh, carrying forward both the research and the implementation on Plasma Cache. But I, I'm, still, I'm, still, I'm still close with them. And I sort of like uh, look at, follow their designs and discuss it with them um, when we meet up at research workshops. But for the most part, they're the ones carrying that forward. Right. Yeah. And so uh, to the listeners, we actually did an episode about maybe a year ago with uh, Carl uh, Flourish uh, about Plasma Cache, actually. So, you know, if you're interested in learning more about like the actual technicals of how Plasma Cache itself works, uh, which Dan proposed. And so, you know, take a look at that and then uh, follow up with the Plasma group to see what the latest developments are. And so, you know, I also know you're pretty involved with the Interledger project as well. Yet, yet another second layer network you're involved with. Uh and did this come out during your time? Like, so, you know, you gave a great talk at the uh, Stanford BPACE conference uh, back in January, where you kind of talked about why HTLCs are harmful and some of the issues you see with the Lightning Network. And then you propose that Interledger seems to be the solution to most of those issues. Were these issues you uh, came across during your development of Starlight? And is that what pushed you toward in- Interledger? Yeah, so I learned about Interledger um, a couple of years ago, mostly from Evan Schwartz, one of the inventors of the protocol, um, along with Stefan Thomas. Um, and they, um, you know, I originally sort of like, they, they originally saw it as something that actually technically looked a lot more like Lightning. It had these HTLCs uh, sort of enforced in the protocol. And then they kind of had this realization that you can do it another way and that you can uh, do this, this method that I described in that, in that talk of instead of having these really complicated smart contracts just uh, for, to, to enforce atomicity across a multi-hop payment, you just send a really tiny amount over and over again. Um, and so the, uh, you can enforce atomicity just sort of like uh, um, down to epsilon, down to a particular limit. And uh, it's, a very, it's a very clever solution. And that, that in particular is what I fell in love with uh, about Interledger was that, that one design. But I think there's a lot of other really clever designs that they've... Um, uh, and, and choices that they've made. So yeah, I learned about that from from Ripple. Working on Starlight. Um, originally, I was planning to implement it like Lightning, like H, with HTLCs, like so. In the Lightning just Network. just for context, uh, Dan, g- could you just explain what it, an HTLC is? Yeah, absolutely. So an HTLC is a hashed time lock contract. It's a very specific smart contract, um, a very simple one, where this, this was originally developed for cross-chain atomic swaps. Um, so the canonical example is Bitcoin and Litecoin. And the basic idea, and Satoshi had sort of a, simp- uh, a um, slightly more complicated version, which is simplified um, by like theory on, on, on the Bitcoin wiki anyway. I, the basic idea is that you lock up some money on the, on the Bitcoin chain, and then you lock up some money on, say, the Litecoin chain. Um, Alice locks it up on Bitcoin. Bob locks it up in Litecoin, and then there's this secret that um, Alice knows that can unlock both of them. Um, so Alice reveals the secret by, by unlocking Bob's locked up Litecoin and receiving the Litecoin, and that gives Bob the information he needs to um, get it from Alice. And you need to have a timeout so that Alice can't just withhold this, this inf- information indefinitely, but that's the, uh, you know, the, you have, you've staggered timeouts on those, um, so it gets a little more complicated, but that's sort of the core idea. And then Lightning had the innovation of doing this inside payment channels rather than on the main chain. Um, you have, you have uh, if you have Alice's payment channel with Bob, Bob is a payment channel with Charlie, um, you can put HTLCs in those payment channels to ensure that a payment from Alice to Charlie that goes through Bob happens atomically. It was a very clever idea um, that uh, Joseph Boone and Ted Dreja had for Lightning originally, um, adding, putting these HTLCs in payment channels. But uh, what Interledger realized... Um, uh, after originally designing their protocol to to sort of require these these enforced HTLCs, is that there's an easier way, especially when you're working in payment channels and payments are super cheap, updates are super cheap. You can just have Alice make a small payment to Bob, and Bob makes a small payment to Charlie, 
and then you just do that over and over again. If any, if at any point someone aborts the protocol, you just stop, and they've and someone has only lost a relatively small amount. Okay, so if I understand correctly here, the idea is that rather than putting locking up money in these uh, in these contracts, you sort of send payments a little bit more, like you send packets in internet routing. So you That's send exactly smaller right. bits. And if one piece of that gets lost in transit, well, then, you know, you might want to take action or, you know, send it again or something like that. That's right. So it's, it's a little different from packets, certainly, because packets are designed to be lost, basically. The way that this protocol works is that you, you, you don't lose any packets. Like, uh, if, you, if you do, you know exactly who um, was responsible for it. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically the same kind of thing um, where instead of sending this whole payment as one giant chunk... Um, that could get stolen um, by one bad actor exiting the protocol. You send it in tiny pieces so that if anyone uh, misbehaves, they can only steal. A, they can only steal from their immediate counterparty, small amounts, so somebody who they already have a channel with, and therefore some kind of trust relationship. One assumes, uh, even even again, just for like if it's for as much as a penny, um, and then two that uh, it's for this limited amount, and only for a limited amount of time. Are there any other projects doing something similar like this? Because I feel like we've talked about this on the podcast before, but I can't remember with whom. I think you. I think you had Interledger on someone right, from Interledger. Yeah. On so, so Interledger point. does this as well. Interledger does this sort of like. Oh yeah. This this, this was developed. This idea. This is Interledger's idea. Um, okay. And it's such a it's such an elegant idea and solves some problems that um, I don't necessarily have to get into about um, about HGLCs, but you can definitely see at my Stanford talk um, HGLC is considered harmful. I uh, where HGLCs these sort of ledger enforced HGLC approach that Lightning takes leads to there being these denial of service attacks on the network. At least if there's multiple assets in play, at least there being this free option problem. Um, and it's just also just much more complicated. And this was the one that I really faced uh, working on Starlight was that trying to enforce HTLCs within payment channels on a, on a platform that wasn't originally designed to really support that um, turned out to be like a, a huge hassle. We had uh, Christian Decker uh, on the podcast a couple, maybe a few months ago now, but yeah, I actually asked him about this exact uh, DOS attack, and he, you know, I feel he had like an okay answer, not the not the best. He kind of like, you know, kind of kicked the can down the road on the answer to how to solve the DOS attack that uh, comes with HDLCs. And so, so just to get it clear, is so is Starlight based on packetized payments, or is it based on atomic HDLCs? So Starlight, um, as far as I got on it, was uh, just for just payment channels. Um, so it doesn't. Have any method for sending multi-hop payments? Does it use HDLCs though? It doesn't use HDLCs, so it's just payment channels. So Alice and Bob. So the way I think about Lightning Network um, and these kind of protocols is that these these two layers. Lightning is a composition of these two different technologies. Uh, the first one is payment channels, and that's just a way for two parties. And typically, really with payment channels, I, I think it's best to stick with bilateral payment channels. People have these more complicated constructions, but only Lightning only uses bilateral payment channels. So you have these two parties, Alice and Bob, and they can make payments to each other, but they can't make payments to anyone else with that money. And what we layer on top of it is some method for multi-hop payments, um, some method for atomic multi-hop payments, so that if Alice is a payment channel with Bob and Bob is a payment channel with Charlie, Alice can make a, Charlie, a payment to Charlie by making a payment to Bob, and then Bob atomically makes a payment to Charlie. And so where Interledger primarily differs from, um, from Lightning is, uh, well, at this layer, um, is that the interledger method of packetized payments uh, is very different from Lightning's method of, of having this, this enforcement of HGLCs uh, in the contract. So what Starlight was, was just a payment channel solution. And we didn't get to, before, before I left, at least we didn't get to implementing um, the second layer. I, was, I think it makes the most sense to do it with interledger, um, in part because it's not possible right now to, do, to really do HGLCs on, on Stellar. It would, have to, it would require a protocol update, as far as I could tell. Um, and it's just so much simpler. And requires you to sort of solve fewer problems, I think. So let's move on then to uh, the Rainbow Network. So can you describe at a high level what this is? Like, what is this new protocol and maybe how, how it pulls some of these ideas from existing projects that you works on? Yep. So uh, the Rainbow Network is an off-chain decentralized synthetics exchange. And it really, again, like, like mostly when I come up with stuff, it's not a really original idea to me. It's just me sort of synthesizing ideas from different projects that I've um, uh, had sort of the privilege of, of working on and working with much smarter people on. 
And those projects very often sort of tend to be maybe more siloed. And so they'll come up with something really clever like Interledger did, and it won't necessarily filter out to the, uh, to the broader ecosystem. And so um, Rainbow takes, from a, takes a few ideas, takes some ideas from um, these on-chain synthetics uh, like Maker and, um, uh, and Uma. It takes ideas from off-chain protocols like, uh, like Lightning Network, Interledger, and Plasma. And just kind of uh, kind of gets some really interesting leverage, no pun intended, out of having combining these two ideas. Okay, so, could, could you just maybe just briefly explain a synthetic asset for those for whom that's unclear? A synthetic asset um, is uh, informally it's an asset that is backed by some collateral that isn't um, that as, that isn't that actual asset. So it's it comes out of it's a derivative, and it come it, it basically comes out of this. On, on the blockchain, is one that's backed by another asset. It could, um, in theory, be black, backed by credit. But the basic idea is that instead of uh, you you actually owning an asset, like me selling you an asset, I can sell you just the exposure to that asset. So I can just say, like, I owe you the price of one Bitcoin um, at any point in time, and uh, a year from now, like, I can make I can make that payment to you and settle that without us ever actually touching Bitcoin. So. Maker, Maker's um, DAI stablecoin is an example of a synthetic. It's a coin that is, there's no dollars on the Ethereum, like native dollars on the Ethereum blockchain. There's no dollars backing each DAI. Instead, it's backed by this other asset, Ether, and the promise enforced by these smart contracts that in some way or another, this DAI will be redeemable. It's not really redeemable in the Maker system, but um, backed by the uh, uh, value of this ETH that's locked up as collateral. Okay, so would you say then that like, U.S. dollars backed by gold would have been a synthetic asset. <laughs> Similar. Um, well, the the one difference there, maybe if it's backed by a fixed amount of it, it's not really a synthetic. It's more of just like a like an IOU for that particular asset. Um, and so a synthetic usually is meant to be a a synthetic version of something for which there's like a natural um, version. So if you had like a you know like oil futures backed by gold or something, um, then that would be. That's sort of a synthetic asset. Um, but yeah, so the, the basic idea being that it, you get the exposures to this particular asset, um, but you don't actually need to deal in the natural one itself, the asset itself. Do synthetic assets always need over collateralization? Not necessarily, especially if you're willing to take credit risk. So you could imagine um, two parties, if one of them trusts the other, um, I can give you a synthetic, a synthetic exposure to this particular asset. Yeah, without it being fully collateralized on my end. A synthetic asset on a blockchain, typically you want it to be fungible. You want it to be acceptable by anybody if it's an on-chain synthetic. Um, and so it does, uh, you think it, would, it needs to be at least um, fully collateralized. And the problem is if the synthetic price rises faster than the collateral price, you could have an asset that's fully collateralized become under collateralized. That's kind of the nature of, the, of working with synthetics. But I think it's, you know, so, so you, you can have someone required to deposit more collateral basically to um, fill it up. And that's what the, that's what the maker system does. And it penalizes someone who doesn't by um, with this liquidation penalty. Okay. So let's go back to, into, with that, with that context, we can now go back to rainbow. Yeah. So please uh, continue explain your explanation on rainbow. So rainbow network is a combination of this idea of synthetic positions with um, this idea of payment channels. So a payment channel is an off chain agreement between two parties um, and again, like, again, I always use two parties where they can make the, sign these messages off chain in a way that these new balances can be settled on chain. And so typically in a payment channel, it'll be like we lock up some escrow, some asset uh, as collateral on the main chain, five Bitcoin. And then we have these balances off chain of like, you know, Alice has three Bitcoin, Bob has two Bitcoin, um, and they can make payments to each other by signing updates to this. Uh, so note this parallel between payment channels and synthetics both have this collateral pool where you have um, some money locked up in escrow um, that in some ways eventually can get settled uh, between these parties. In a synthetic, it's based on the price of some reference asset. In payment channels, it's based on these messages that have been signed off chain in this game that people play to, um, to exit the correct state. And so Rainbow combines these two ideas and it says, um, we can have an off-chain payment channel but instead of, if it could be backed by, by Bitcoin, it could be backed entirely by ETH. But instead of it settling based on just the balances that people have signed here, 
um, on the uh, off chain, it's also calculated based on the price of some reference asset. So that means that two parties can enter into this payment channel where they say uh, it's backed entirely by ETH, but where the where they agree off chain, they, they're doing these trades off chain, and they agree when we settle this, the amount of ETH that each of us gets, the amount of collateral that each of us gets, is computed in part based on the price of uh, of USD, the price of ETH relative to USD. So that's what allows them to do these to trade basically any asset they want, even with only ETH as collateral on the main chain. I think most of our listeners will have some fundamental understanding of Lightning Network and how payment channels work, and there it's it's pretty. I mean, it's like pretty simply just a, a payment going for in one direction or another on a channel. So it could be for a payment for something that's done completely offline, like you know, like a merchant payment, um, or for um, some other cryptocurrency, for example, in the in in the case of an exchange. But in that case, that other asset isn't being transferred necessarily on that payment channel. Um, so, for example, you know, Alice wants to buy some Bitcoin from Bob, uh, sorry, some, some some Ether from Bob, and she sends Bitcoin over Lightning Channel, and then Bob agrees to send her the Ether, you know, on her Ether wallet. Um, in this case, all of those assets are being are being transferred through payment channels on the Rainbow Network, correct? Well, so what how Rainbow is different is that you can trade, yeah, you can trade different assets. That's right, that aren't collateralized. You don't have any collateral locked up on a blockchain in this particular asset, um, but parties on this network nevertheless can trade them. One benefit of this, it, it gives you a lot more flexibility. It means you can trade, for example, fiat um, currencies in these, in these channels, which is not something you can do um, generally sort of trust, trustlessly on something like Lightning unless you can have a synthetic already on chain um, for that particular asset. Um, it also means that you don't need necessarily to have these multi-hop payments and with Rainbow Network, you, you, you can do these sort of multi-hop trades, but you don't need to do multi-hop payments across multiple channels um, in order to trade uh, uh, any asset for any other asset. So if I have this channel, uh, Rainbow Channel with somebody um, back entirely by ETH, I can um, trade dollars with them, I can trade gold with them, I can trade really any computable number um, I can turn into, into something that I can uh, uh, trade with them. And so that, yeah, so that's sort of the benefit is not just that it can support any asset because you could, you could theoretically have Lightning Network across multiple um, assets. And that's really what Interledger is designed for is to be a um, sort of like layer two that spans across many different um, base layer one chains, but that um, even on one single channel, it can trade any particular, any asset that you want. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft have you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS, and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. Could we like maybe walk through an example uh, where let's say, you know, where we both have ETH on Ethereum and I'm trying to buy some BTC from you or some synthetic BTC. I want exposure to BTC. Uh, could you maybe walk us through an example of how this would actually work? Like, what would be the steps of doing this? Sure. So, um, I should I should first say that you know I, I've so far kind of uh, elided the question of how rainbow channels actually do enforce at the time of exit that mm -hmm. um, uh, that that it settles based on this price uh, the price of these assets. And there's a few ways to achieve that um, 
one of which involves a price oracle, but uh, which don't they don't necessarily require one. But uh, but yeah, so so I'll, so I'll walk you through so the the general idea. So if you if let's suppose they start out with eighty ETH each, and they want to trade forty ETH for one Bitcoin, that might be right. No, it's, that's yeah, it's about right. We'll say, we'll say forty. So the uh, um, they start out with with Alice has a balance of eighty ETH. Bob has a balance of eighty ETH. So Bob wants to get Bitcoin um, because their their names start with B. So um, what happens is Bob's balance of ETH goes down to from eighty to forty, and uh, his balance of Bitcoin goes up from zero to one. Uh, this you know this this all has to remain balanced within this. It all has to always add up to exactly one hundred sixty ETH, the amount that's actually collateralized. So then on the other side, Alice. She goes up to 120 ETH, but she goes down to negative one Bitcoin. So when we compute her balance um, at the time that they exit, we say, okay, she's got 120 ETH, but then we have to subtract that by the amount of ETH that one Bitcoin is worth. Um, so the, that, that's kind of how you achieve, that allows you to short, this allows Alice to get a short position in Bitcoin. It allows... Um, Bob to get this long position in Bitcoin in a, in a channel that isn't collateralized by any Bitcoin. Um, and it actually allows people, these parties to basically get leverage on, uh, on a particular asset so that they uh, note, note that Alice has leverage on ETH. She, if ETH goes up, um, her uh, balance goes up by, by significantly more than it would have um, when they were just sort of at, at uh, uh, 80 ETH each. So this actually seems very similar. It reminds me of the original bit assets uh, system on BitShares uh, back in like 2014 or so, where they actually, you know, I think the, techn- the the financial term for this is a CFD, a contract for difference, where basically That's what's right. happening. Right. And so, you know, bit assets was actually using these uh, CFDs uh, in order to create synthetic assets. So if people remember the uh, BitUSD, uh, was their most popular one, but they also had everything from like you know bit gold to like bit bit R, uh, bit RMB and like they 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 were essentially doing this synthetics and so essentially what you've done here is you've just taken this uh, bit asset system but figured out how to make it work on a second layer system uh, on on top of payment channels rather than in a, on a contract on the main chain. That's right. Um, and one thing you can do. You know, like putting it on a payment channel, in part, you know, it's like we just make everything a little more efficient, but it also opens up these new possibilities. Um, there's this nice kind of synergy between these uh, these two things that, uh, yeah, I think I think is, is, there's some there's some benefits from having it off chain. So yeah, so I, I, I can and I explain. Maybe it's worth explaining now how a rainbow channel like actually works, how it settles. Um, so there's three ways to do it uh, to sort of construct a rainbow channel. One of them is basically using price oracles and smart contracts. Um, the second is to have f- physical settlement of this asset where the asset itself has to actually be delivered. And the third is to have this continuous cash settlement of the, of the value of it um, on the channel. So uh, the first um, is maybe, maybe sort of the most straightforward is if you have some price oracle, if you have some reliable price feed that can be verified on the blockchain, and if your blockchain is like Ethereum, if it's you know, Turing complete or sufficiently fully featured that it can do this kind of calculation, then people who are signing these messages off chain, um, when it when it settles the escrow contract that is handling the settlement of this payment channel, just computes the current balances um, of each of the parties based on their on their current portfolio in the channel, and just sort of allocates the collateral um, appropriately. So that's maybe the most straightforward. Do you, yeah, does that make sense? I think it makes sense to me. Where so essentially, you know, whenever so back to that example, you know, I had a hundred, Alice had one hundred twenty. Uh, ETH and Bob had 40 ETH, but Alice had negative one BTC. And so whenever uh, they cl- try to close the channel, it basically sends it to the on-chain Oracle that says, okay, the price of BTC is now 50 ETH. And so now, you know, Alice is, what actually Alice gets out is actually only 70 ETH and Bob gets out 90 ETH. Yeah, exactly. So it just sort of computes that. Um, that's, you know, and it's, does it's this relatively... require a trust, but this does require a trusted Oracle, right? It requires some kind of price Oracle, some way of determining the price. And so if you want to avoid that, you can use one of these other, these other two approaches. Um, so the second one is physical settlement. And so what that means is, 
like traditionally when you when you've got a um a future or a derivative you can either cash settle it or or physically settle it um and physical settlement literally just means like i'm going to actually give you the asset itself um so the idea here would be um and we can get to bitcoin in a second but maybe it's easier if they're trading some asset that's already on um ethereum like dai um which is the maker's stable coin uh if they have some synthetic position in dai and one of the parties is uh, has like a position of negative 100 dai and some eth and the other party has a position of positive 100 dai and um some eth say then when they settle the channel the contract could require that alice who anyone who's who's short a position like alice is short dai has to actually send 100 dai to bob in order to close out this channel um and if she, and if she doesn't then all the collateral goes to Bob. So here, there's still a risk that the channel becomes under collateralized, or that or that um, Alice goes uh, goes negative in her in her total balance. But if Alice is positive, then she's incentivized to actually really deliver this asset, um, the die to Bob, uh, because then she gets the the uh, collateral her collateral out of the contract, the ETH that she's owed. And if she doesn't um, actually do that, then Bob then it's forfeit. So that's that's this method of physical settlement. Um, it works relatively straightforwardly when it's another asset on the same chain and it's a smart contract platform. Um, but it actually also works for Bitcoin. So this is a cool construction. So uh, we could have a channel on Ethereum um, where someone Alice is short Bitcoin. She's got a balance of negative one Bitcoin. When they settle it, the contract can require that Alice sends one Bitcoin to Bob and then provides an SPV proof that that transaction occurred that is verified by the, uh, by the contract. So an SPV proof, simplified payment verification, it's a protocol described in the original Satoshi white paper. Basically, um, you just reveal, you just reveal um, the inclusion of this transaction, um, a Merkle proof that is included in a Bitcoin block, and then say like six blocks of proof of work on top of that. Um, and this proof can be verified by a light client. It can also be verified by the Ethereum chain, for example, itself. So, of course, Cosmos works um, using, uh, uh, using SPV proofs. Uh, in this case, this is a, Bitcoin, this is a proof of work uh, SPV proof. But the idea would be Alice would have to send one Bitcoin to Bob, generate an SPV proof that it was included in the Bitcoin blockchain, and then reveal that to the Ethereum smart contract, which is programmed to verify it. But so this only works with blockchain native assets, right? That's so I right. can't do this for dollars, for example. That's right. So it, it only works with blockchain native assets where there's, where there's either like some ERC-20 or some um, asset whose SPV proofs are, are readable by, by the chain that you're working on. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's limited in its application, certainly. When you have that and you have either these SPV proofs to other systems or, you know, yeah, wh what's the benefit of using a synthetic in this case instead of just using, you know, just trading on actual Bitcoin? Um, well, it's, it's that we can, you can do whatever trades you want with your counterparty and you can trade Bitcoin with them while only having, say, ETH locked up as collateral, right? So it's much more flexible. If you were to do this in Lightning, you would have to have some Bitcoin locked up in a, in a Bitcoin payment channel, have some ETH locked up in, that, in the ETH payment channel, and then do atomic payments across those. But this is generally more flexible that you can, um, that you can do that. So you mentioned this this third way of settling, which is to have constant stream of of uh, payments. Can you describe that? That's right. And this is um, people have noted that like this this idea um, is kind of inspired by the interledger idea I was I was talking before. And like this is just generally true that basically every every idea I've ever had was stolen by someone else who had a, uh, stolen by me from someone else who had like a like a really clever idea. And I just sort of apply it um, to everything I can I can find. So this is. Um, the idea here is we have some particular balance on let's let's say we're doing it on Bitcoin and we don't we can't use price oracles it can't verify SPV proofs of other chains there's no other assets really on Bitcoin so um, we just have a Bitcoin backed payment channel on Lightning and Alice and Bob have this channel with each other well they can do a rainbow channel on top of that and the way they do it is you informally agree at a higher layer you say which is not enforced by the contract you say you know like we're now I'm going to be like slightly long uh, USD and you're going to be slightly short USD. Um, so we basically traded Bitcoin for dollars on this channel. And then as the price of fiat changes, um, you like every five seconds update, uh, sign an update to uh, update the payment channel so that you can update your balances. So if it was 
five Bitcoin and five Bitcoin, and then someone traded four Bitcoin for eight, uh, sorry, one Bitcoin for eight thousand dollars. So it became a balances of four Bitcoin and eight thousand dollars and six Bitcoin and negative four thousand dollars. Then um, you'd, the current update still looks like five Bitcoin, five Bitcoin, as far as the Lightning Protocol is concerned. And then if fiat crashes, then Alice's balance um, uh, goes down because part of her balance is in fiat. Um, and Bob's goes up. What happens is they just sign a new update saying, like, now I'm worth 4.9. Uh, Alice has 4.9 Bitcoin and Bob has uh, 5.1. And if you do this every five seconds, then the risk of your counterparty cheating you by not signing a new update uh, is um, one hopes sort of negligible. What happens if there's a flash crash or a flash like rate rise in prices and the counterparty decides, I don't want to play this anymore? Yeah, so that, that, that's the risk you take. So it may not be a great idea for, like, for incredibly volatile assets, but you can look at sort of what the, what the max price difference is. And over, over like five seconds, it's pretty, uh, which is, um, you know, even you probably could sign an update every five seconds. And Lightning, you may even be able to do it every like two seconds. Um, I think that, that shouldn't necessarily be too, too much of a risk. And so you just have to sort of tolerate that, uh, that free option that you're giving them, but it's because it's only a free option for like a couple seconds. So no, th- this is one of the areas where, you get this new benefit from doing it in, with payment channels, from doing this protocol off-chain. This is not a protocol that you could do on-chain because it requires these updates every five seconds. So because you've gone off-chain, you can now have this new way of doing a contract for difference, um, a relatively trustless contract for difference, uh, because you've just like, dramatically lowered the cost of a, pay, of a, uh, of a transaction, uh, of a payment uh, channel update here relative to doing this protocol on-chain. Here, you still do need a price oracle as well, right? Or at least some way of you and your counterparty agreeing on what the change in price is. Yep, that's true. So you can, you can independently, you can look at whatever price you want. You need to, um, you, do, you do need some way, yeah, for you, for you to know what the price is and to have one that, that you sort of agree with your uh, counterparty on. But so that could be like the median of a bunch of different exchange feeds, right? But each of you can go look at those independently and uh, if you lie um, or, you know, so A, those don't have to be signed by the exchanges, right? Um, so unlike with Maker, where you actually need this pr- process of taking these exchange feeds and having oracles report them to the, to the blockchain, this is something that you can just do subjectively. You just, you just look at it. And if something goes wrong, if, these, if, if, if you like sort of detect these feeds have been um, tampered with, you can just sort of halt the protocol. And so another thing that you mentioned in the paper that makes this third method interesting is that it can actually actually already be implemented on Bitcoin's Lightning Network, which you know you can't really do with the first two because of lack of like scripting capabilities. Yep, uh, that's right. And so I've talked to a couple of people who are um, working on Lightning applications who are kind of interested in doing something like this. Mm-hmm. And so does the channel that uh does the payment channel that uh a rainbow channel is based on right does that actually have to be a literal singular channel or could it be like an ilp connection and or like an ilp channel or could it be like a multi-hop lightning ch- lightning thing can that act as a singular rainbow channel yeah that's absolutely right um you can have sort of a virtual rainbow channel um that is settled in this particular way uh, the, yeah, if, if you, like Alice and Charlie don't have to necessarily have a channel with each other, they just have to be able to pay each other um, uh, over, this, over this method. So yeah, it could be, it could be a multi-hop lightning connection between them. It could be um, an ILP, uh, multi-hop ILP connection between them. Uh, I think you'll probably get screwed on fees if you try to do that, or if you, if you, if you try to update too frequently um, and it's a multi-hop payment. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's certainly possible. Okay, so this is great when we have me and you who want to create a you know rainbow channel between us. Uh, could you tell us a little bit now? Okay, how do we take these rainbow channels and turn them into a rainbow network, and what is the benefit of such a network? Yeah, absolutely. So um, suppose we want to use this protocol um, for trading, right? And so someone wants to actually go uh, just sort of like sign up. Um, have uh, enter into one of these channels with a counterparty and then just trade whatever they want on that, right? So they're, they're, it's, they put in some ETH and then now they're trading like USD with it, they're trading um, Bitcoin with it. Uh, the problem here is that maybe the counterparty to that trade doesn't especially want to be 
um, ha- take the exact inverse position of the trader at all particular times, right? So, like, if if they're trading with somebody, you need to actually ha- with, with sort of just naive rainbow channels, you need to actually have a channel with somebody who wants to take the opposite position. So, if you want to go leverage long ETH, they have to sort of uh, dim- diminish their ETH. Pr- uh, um, position. If you want to like go long Bitcoin, they now have to go short Bitcoin, and that so that that's sort of a, a challenging um, thing. If if it's just sort of like this immediate counterparty, so uh, and note, remember these are these are bilateral um, agreements. So like if I've got money in this channel with someone, they're the only person I can directly trade with. Uh, but there's a way that they can um, balance out that exposure by making that that person my counterparty can make the opposite trade. With someone else, they can hedge their position. Um, so you can hedge this on a like actual physical exchange or on Bitmex or something, right? So like the uh, like if Alice is a channel with Bob, Bob could go whenever Alice goes like extra long Bitcoin, Bob could go short Bitcoin on on Bitmex or something in order to end up saying flat across these these uh, positions, or they could do it in another rainbow channel. Um, they could they could have a channel with someone else where they do that. So the architecture that I sort of imagine for this would be probably you have like a couple very large market makers that um, are responsible for just hedging um, people's positions, uh, and like they just sort of like take all trades, and then they just have so many trades with so many people that and that they can kind of net out a lot of their exposure, um, and then maybe trade on some centralized exchange to really hedge away the rest. Uh, and then there'd be sort of users who are just connecting and they can just trade in whatever they want. And their counterparty is taking a spread for, um, for yeah, either. And, the, and that counterparty either hedges directly with, with any sort of like a market maker themselves, or they connect to another, to a market maker and hedge with them. So these market makers turn into sort of the hubs in this rainbow network. That's right. But so question though, you know, this is kind of, I guess, a similar question that, you know, a lot of people concern when it comes to lightning as well is this requires a lot of liquidity lockup for the hubs here uh in lightning it requires you know the hubs to have a lot of lockup with all the people that they're serving and here it seems that in order to like connect two people in a you know two opposite rainbow channels with each other i have to as the market maker lock up collateral on both these channels and this doesn't seem a very capital efficient uh, way to do this. That's that's absolutely right. And something I've been talking about with some of the plasma people. Um, uh, and so pl- plasma, in part, is a um, and especially plasma cash and plasma debit. Um, I consider them there is they're an attempted solution to this particular problem with Lightning, which is um, this this extra capital lockup. Um, which yeah, was absolutely is also a problem in uh, in Rainbow. But so I've been talking to them, and it's still sort of in early stages of of really trying to solve this problem. But to figure out how to let um, uh, these parties, uh, let these market makers, um, basically, uh, maybe they maybe they facilitate the trade initially, but then they can ca- kind of get out of the position by matching Alice. If, if Alice really wants long Bitcoin exposure and Bob wants short Bitcoin exposure, matching them together um, rather than the hub having to lock up their own liquidity in order to uh, maintain this uh, the, this uh, a fully um, collateralized hedge trade. So that yeah, so that's that's something that we're sort of actively working on. I think some techniques from Plasma will help. I think uh, yeah, possibly you know some some sort of like uh, novel ones. So yeah, talk to some Plasma people some, and and uh, Hart from Uma as well. I know is thinking about this. So allow people to become brokers instead of dealers. Yes, uh, I, I definitely would not use any legal terms about what anyone <laughs> is doing here. And again, like you know, I, I make no representations about what anyone would be. Uh, uh, what the legal status of anyone actually implementing and and operating these nodes would be, um, but yeah, that's that's that analogy does seem seem about right. So, what's the application here? What when one uses for? Where do you see this being used in the future? Um, and I, I guess the follow up question is if and when it gets implemented, which uh, I think you've um, spoken about in your paper. Yeah. So. Um, the basic idea, I think, for it is, is off-chain exchange, um, is decentralized exchange. And so it's, it's a relatively uh, efficient, it's a like, throughput efficient, not necessarily a, a capital efficient yet, way to do uh, trustless uh, trading. And you know, we know that 
uh, trading cryptocurrencies is one of right now uh, one of the few applications for which there really is product market fit. People seem to be doing a lot of it. It also works as a multi-asset payment network, so you can make payments in any of these assets uh, in any asset, just like as if it's as if it's like the uh, over inner ledger or as if it's like a, a Lightning network. Um, so that's that's sort of another another possibility there. As for who's going to implement it, you know, I'm I'm not going to implement it. Um, I think, uh, in part, you know, I have a, I have a full time job working uh, doing doing research here at, at Paradigm, and um, it wouldn't necessarily. Yeah, I think I think you know there'd be a lot of challenges. I think to really uh, getting um, a rainbow uh, like launching it um, and bootstrapping it that aren't necessarily as uh, really really sort of like big problems, but aren't necessarily as technically interesting to me. Um, and so yeah, so you know again, I I think uh, anyone is welcome to the to the ideas. Like I said, like few of the ideas are really original to me. Um, they're mostly uh, uh, combinations of other people's stuff. So people are absolutely welcome to. Um, to work on it, and I've had some encouraging conversations with people who have been inspired to to work on at least sort of similar things. And some people, so it may end up getting implemented. Um, and you know, I, I'm I definitely chatted with people who uh, I think it would be great if they do implement it. But one last question about uh, Rainbow Channels uh, before we move on is: in the paper, you 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 mentioned that you know it's called Rainbow Channels because rainbows are just multicolored lightning. Uh, have you talked to any meteorologists about this claim? <laughs> I, I didn't see a source on that one. Yeah, I mean, I I was thinking of looking it up, but I just knew in my gut um, that that's how uh, rainbows work. So it's it's <laughs> so the, the the basic idea of uh, rainbow right is that because in one channel you can have many assets, so it's kind of a multicolored thing. I also I, I like it because like I, I really like the rainbow theme. I have my rainbow shoes here. Um, <laughs> I think it's it's a it's fun branding for it. Um it sort of matches generally the the Ethereum thing. Uh and because yeah, sort of by analogy in some ways to the to the lightning network certainly was the other thinking there. I mean, isn't a rainbow light refraction in raindrops? Uh, it has nothing to do with lightning, does it? <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> That's your opinion, man. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a blockchain engineer, not a not a meteorologist. Okay, well, let's let's move on to uh, our our last and final topic, which is uh, the uh, IV smart contracting language. Was something I discovered uh, doing the research for this uh, episode, and is actually quite interesting. I, I tried it out, and I mean, I was kind of like fiddled around with the uh, with the tool that you have uh, that you built. Um, can you talk to us about IV and what were your goals here? Sure. So um, IV was a programming language developed at Chain, where I used to work. Um, and when I come on, came on, it was it was already um, people sort of had the had the basic design for it, and it was compiling to our uh, proprietary uh, uh, VM, the, the chain VM. And something that I worked on um, relatively soon as as, uh, as soon as I started was working on it um, and really focusing on that language was also compiling it to Bitcoin script. And the reason is that there's no you know it's pretty hard right now to write a uh, smart contract in Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has this scripting language. It's a low-level stack-based uh, language. But it's just kind of awkward and, and unwieldy um, to use. And uh, even more to like think about. People don't, people, when you sort of like read a Bitcoin uh, script uh, contract, it's just a bunch of like opcodes and you kind of have to like work out in your head what it means. Um, and I think that was holding back the space in some ways, maybe conceptually, just uh, people having to like actually when you look at the lightning docs, there's like these, these really long Bitcoin script uh, programs um, that, yeah, again, they don't even really explain what they do and how the, how the logic works. And so Ivy is kind of a simpler way of, uh, of expressing those and reading those as well as if you want writing them. Um, so mostly I see it as an educational tool and one that maybe was, I was trying to sort of help people understand like the functionality of Bitcoin script and how what these important Bitcoin script programs actually do. Um, so yeah, so I so I came out with this with the uh, so I worked on this tool and Chain was very supportive um, generally of me working on it. The, everyone there really likes Bitcoin, so they were supportive of me working on it. So um, with uh, with one of my other colleagues, Boymeyer, we released um, a uh, uh, this playground for the uh, for Ivy and uh, sort of a very limited SDK and compiler for it. Um, I found that really enjoyable and. I, I think it, it helped me thinking about Bitcoin script. It helped me thinking about sort of smart contract programming language design. But 
really, yeah, again, it, it was meant, I think, to, to mostly teach about um, both Bitcoin script and the limitations of Bitcoin script. So when people try it out and I can say, imagine if we had this opcode, here's the kind of program you could write. It was a hard kind of argument to make when people are stuck in the low level of just looking at these uh, uh, stack-based languages. I, I played around with it a little bit as well. And, you know, I really like it as a contracting language for like, if you're, if you're talking about like real financial use cases, it seems like, you know, it's a very declarative language. And so, you know, I, I like to phrase it. I, I haven't tried this yet, but I have a feeling I could maybe get an account, like teach an accountant to write this, write using, uh, using Ivy. Cause it, it, it's very simple. It's just like a set of like, you know, very, very English readable and like just saying like, oh, this is the constraints that like this money is spendable if these constraints are met. So like, you know, if this much time elapsed or whatnot. And so I, I think it's a really cool language, but you know, it never really saw much wide adoption. Right. And so, you know, I, I, you know, I, people have played around the playground and stuff, but like, do you know of anyone like actually using this to like deploy real Bitcoin scripts in the real world? Yeah. So, I mean, um, first I really hope nobody is using it to deploy real Bitcoin scripts on mainnet <laughs> because, you know, it, it's, it's, while we, we work as hard as we could to kind of get rid of a bunch of the bugs in it, it's definitely not, it hasn't been fully audited. Um, and there may very well be bugs that someone that, that you could do if you, uh, you know, could find in the compiler. So I hope nobody's, and there's a lot of warnings on it. You know, this is for educational purposes. There's no, um, please don't use it on mainnet. The reaction from the Bitcoin community. So I was somewhat worried. Um, and as someone who I, I consider myself, you know, like part of the Bitcoin community and I got a foot in the Bitcoin community and I really like them, um, but also um, in Ethereum. And then I've got friends and, you know, like uh, we're going to ripple with, with Interledger and Bitcoin Cash. Um, some people like, I, I was, I, was a little worried that the Bitcoin community would react negatively um, to this and say like, we don't want smart contracts, smart contract languages are dangerous or like, or sort of criticizing it. And we didn't get that reaction at all, um, but maybe got something worse, which was um, people saying, aha, look at this. And, you know, the reaction was very positive, but it was, this is great. Look at this. See, Bitcoin already has smart contracts. We don't need to change anything. And as I said before, almost my entire goal with the, with the language was to sort of show the limitations. Um, and, you know, I, I appreciate that you like the language. Like, I find, it, I find it somewhat frustrating because there's a lot of features that I'd really like to add that I think would be, would be useful mm -hmm. that you can't, because not, at least not in the Bitcoin version, because of the limitations of Bitcoin script. You don't have, you don't have covenants. You don't have a string concatenation opcode. You don't have the ability to check a signature on data um, other than the, than the transaction hash. And... Uh, I was sort of hoping by by showing this and using it as an educational tool that I could say, okay, here you go, like, and here is what uh, the cool thing that we could do um, if we had a if we had more expressive opcodes. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I still I still hear people sort of referring to it as, look, see, we can do smart contracts on um, Bitcoin with Ivy, but it's like you can't a you can't do anything more. You know, it doesn't add any features to Bitcoin certainly because it's entirely compiled to Bitcoin script, but also. Yeah, I mean, like, like, look at how limited it is. Like, you can do a, you can do a couple things. You can verify a few things. You can basically write a multisig, um, custom multisig, or like HTLC or something like Lightning with it. Um, but yeah, then so so as far as people deploying actual applications, so the only two smart contracts that are used on the Bitcoin on Bitcoin main chain are multisigs, um, which are generally very simple constructions, and Lightning. Um, that's that's basically it. Um, I guess Arwin I think has a different payment channel protocol. So. Um, yeah, maybe like just, I'd say payment channels in general for those, um, I'm actually not surprised. I think that people aren't using Ivy in production because I wouldn't suggest that they do, you know, like, uh, Lalu is able to write really efficient Bitcoin scripts and there, there's only a couple scripts they have to actually write. Um, so I wouldn't want them to like write it in Ivy and not actually, uh, figure it all out by hand and test it. Uh, so, cause it's something that you write once and then use over and over again. What I'd really like to see, I think, and this is a blog post I've meant to write for a while, is trying to explain the Lightning scripts. Um, it's an educational purpose, trying to explain the Lightning scripts using Ivy. Um, and that's something that I think I just would have to do and haven't had the time to. Any plans of maybe having Ivy compiled to more expressive systems? Like, for example, you know, Bitcoin Cash does have the uh, check data sig or even like something like EVM, where like, you know, it's a much, much more expressive VM, but it would be still nice to have this very easy to use language. Yeah, I've, t I've talked to a couple of people who are actually adapting um, 
every once in a while someone comes to me saying they want to adapt Ivy for Bitcoin Cash. It's like coffee script for blockchains. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and I've actually, so I, re- I wrote Ivy compilers to, I wrote one to the EVM. I wrote one to, to Chain VM and TXVM, um, which were the VMs that we worked on at, uh, uh, at Chain. I wrote one to, to Michelson, which is um, Tezos's smart contract language. Um, and for a while, I was just like implementing compiler, Ivy compilers for fun. I think, honestly, like I, I think it's, it's not, it doesn't have enough features, even, even when you sort of like add these other opcodes to really be, um, be fully useful as a smart contract language. Um, so I, I'm, you know, again, like I, I wrote a test one to, um, that, that works on Ethereum and you can do some cool stuff with it, but you couldn't, you couldn't implement plasma in it. You couldn't implement payment channels. Uh, well, you, you could implement payment channels in it, but not really like, uh, necessarily the, the right kind. I do think there's room for a declarative programming language for Ethereum. Um, but I've sort of moved on mostly from programming language design uh, for better or worse. So I hope someone comes out to do that, but I think there's still going to be a big left to do it. Okay, so where can people find you and where can people uh, learn more about everything you're working on? Sure, so um, if you want to learn more about Ivy, you can go to um, ivy-lang.org and that's the um, Ivy playground that I mentioned, which allows you to, uh, it's sort of a in-browser IDE um, for writing these these uh, Bitcoin scripts using Ivy, um, you can find more about the more out about the Rainbow Network by going to rainbownet.work, um, and that's the Rainbow that's where the Rainbow Network paper is hosted. And generally, you can find me on Twitter at at Dan Robinson on Twitter, and that's uh, uh, my DMs are open, and I love to hear about people who are interested in these in these same topics. Okay, great. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.